I'm just gonna give one more moment and then we'll dive in. Thank you for your patience, for those who might be joining us in uh, the virtual space. We appreciate you joining us on a Sunday afternoon, sunny afternoon. I know we would all prefer to be uh, riding uh, with Mr. Washington. No, I just want to be a Sunday, Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Look, are you funny? I wish it was Sunday. <laughs> Indeed. We'll give high members just one more moment. Well, I want to stay true to my word. I want to welcome you all into the virtual space today. Uh, wow. Amazing. Well, I don't know if I have to start over, but welcome, welcome into the space for the historic Albina Advisory Board meeting. Uh, it's a bright, beautiful, sunny day. So thank you for sharing part of your afternoon. Uh, we have a shorter agenda uh, than usual, uh, but some great uh, information to share with HAB members, uh, get your thoughts uh, and feedback. Uh, on um, our progress moving forward. So thank you, thank you. I know we have some that are joining us um, in just a moment, but we're gonna go ahead and move forward. Uh, so next slide, please, Miss Natalie. Uh, thank you to all of you. If we have some uh, public folks uh, in the space, there'll be an opportunity for public comment. Uh, everyone else, if you would mute when you are not speaking, if you have technical difficulties, we have a great team of folks who are available to help you. Uh, you can avail yourself to the number on the screen. Next slide. All right, you all know the drill. Um, today's agenda, public comment. Uh, we're gonna have a brief uh, update uh, in regards to project, uh, the director's update. Then we're gonna have an exciting uh, recap in regards to the youth design forum that was held uh, just this past Saturday. Uh, and then um, my colleagues from the urban design team uh, will give us a brief update on the uh, design element survey and we'll have some continued de design discussions before we wrap up our meeting today. Next slide. Your voice matters, we need you all here. We need your feedback. We need uh, all of your passion uh, and expertise uh, to help us move this project forward. So please uh, engage with us as much as possible. Uh, raise your hand, I'll look for you. Uh, sometimes we use the chat uh, just to capture all of the thoughts but would love to hear your voice. Uh, be authentic and genuine, I know you will. Uh, we have been working with each other for some time now. So listen for understanding, deal with issues, not people. Uh, today, I don't think we'll experience any discomfort, but I think in this process, we understand this is a passion project. Uh, our community is something that we love and we're passionate about. So some of these things are uncomfortable to talk about, but I appreciate that you'd remain respectfully engaged and we're going to expect and accept that we can't solve everything today. So there will be non-closure, but we are always working. Uh, it's my goal to help us move forward each step after each meeting. Next slide, please. Um, I am not sure if we have folks in the queue, but I'd love to open this opportunity for public comment. Thanks, Erica. Um, just to reiterate, uh, members of the public viewing the meeting on the live stream are now invited to make a verbal public comment by phone at this time. And if you wish to do so, please dial the phone number shown on the slide um, on the right side there. And then when prompted, enter the meeting ID and passcode shown there below the phone number. Um, after doing so, you'll be placed in a virtual waiting room until your turn to speak. And when the time comes, we'll uh, invite you to unmute yourself and speak your public comment. Uh, we'll allow up to two minutes for verbal comments, and then um, you will be muted at time. And if you'd like to provide 
more extensive comments to members of the public or um, written comments, uh, please see the options listed on the meeting agenda. Um, and I'm just looking to see if we have any members of the public in the waiting room right now and, and not seeing any right now. We do have a few viewers on the live stream. Uh, so we can just allow another moment or two and see if um, any commenters do appear in the waiting room for us. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, let's just give another moment, make sure there's an opportunity for all of that dialing and entering codes. <laughs> yes, there are several digits to dial to get to where you need to be. Well, seeing no hands, uh, Ms. Natalie, if we are still clear, I might just move us forward. Okay, we are still clear, Erica, uh, I'll move ahead. Perfect. Well, for those who are watching on the live stream, we thank you for joining us. And if you do have comments, please make sure that you go to the I-5 Rose Quarter website and there is an opportunity for you to email your comments. Uh, and we're more than happy to um, help address uh, your comments and concerns. With that, I would love to uh, turn it over to Tia Williams. Thanks, Erica, um, and thanks everyone. Um, I will actually be doing your director update today. I'll be stepping in for Megan Channel, who I know wanted to be here tonight, but um, couldn't. So um, I'll be giving kind of some over, um, some high level um, updates on the project. Um, so first just wanted to touch base on the IGA that is um, anticipated to go to council, Portland City Council um, sometime in early to mid June. Um, we're working with um, PBOT staff and the commissioner's offices um, to get that submitted for, um, for the council agenda. Um, you may have seen, I believe that the draft of, an, uh, of a HAB support letter um, has gone out um, to you all. So um, hoping to get some feedback on that. Um, just, I think it was really powerful for um, city council to know the role that HAB played and just that um, to, again, hear from you all about the work. Um, and I think we'll be coordinating um, to potentially have some folks go to sign up um, to testify. Um, for city council. Um, and then the other thing on um, updates as it relates to letters is we did talk probably back earlier and um, at the beginning of this year about putting together um, another letter to, to the federal delegation um, from the HAB. That's something that we want to revisit, but definitely want to prioritize this letter to the IGA, knowing that that's coming up sooner. Um, so we'll be back um, coming to you all to talk about um, again doing sort of a collective draft for a letter um, to the federal delegation. Um, and then I think the only other update that I have is just an update on some of the field work happening for the project. So starting late May and continuing through June, ODOT um, contractor crews will be out there doing some geotechnical investigations um, that includes kind of soil and material sampling in the Rose Quarter project area. Um, so this is uh, you know, focused on pre-development work. Um, it's not construction work. Um, and these activities will really support the design that um, is helping us get ready for construction. Um, so if you see folks out there, that's what that is. Um, we are also combining and leveraging that with other ODOT maintenance work that's scheduled in the area. Um, so that just helps us minimize disruptions and just make sure that we're kind of connected and coordinated. Um, uh, on that front. So with that, that's all of the updates that we have. Happy to take any questions on either of those topics. Um, and if I, if I don't see any questions, then Erica, I'll turn it back over to you. Indeed. Any questions uh, for Tia in regards to um, letters of support uh, or anything that she shared in the project update? Seeing none, thank you, Tia. Appreciate uh, you sharing with us. Uh, at this point, I would love the opportunity to uh, invite um, your colleagues, Brenda Vasa Brown, 
uh, and a few others to um, help us share out about the Youth Design Forum. Uh, this past Saturday, I uh, was at Emmanuel Church, uh, and um, I believe uh, it's the start of an op awesome opportunity to have multi-generational, intergenerational feedback uh, on this uh, project. Uh, so with that, uh, Sprinavasa, love to yeah. have you share. Sure. Um, can you confirm how much time do I have? And that way I can make sure to make my remarks fit. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I think uh, we, we have about 15 minutes um, for the recap on the, on the youth design form. Okay. Okay, cool. So, um, okay. With, with having said that, what I'd like to do is just share out some of the feedback that I captured from the groups at the end um, and also some next steps and ways that we can kind of see this work moving forward. But before I do that, I just want to say thank you um, to Erica and Dr. Holt and Mira and Bill and Megan and Andrew and the Word is Bond team and all of our facilitators um, and the folks who came together from across our community, um, Sharon, uh, Ms. Sharon Gary Smith for coming and spending that Saturday with us, facilitating these sessions, talking about the project, breaking down these concepts for the youth. And overall, um, it was a very successful and positive experience. I would say that this Saturday to me felt like a true example of community resilience, where you have folks from across generations excited to come together and learn. We had dancers who were supposed to be the entertainment for the lunch, um, who showed up with all sorts of families and, and additional people who came and folks who weren't registered participated. And so we had some great problems to figure out in the moment, um, which is, you know, true, true community work. Um, but overall, the youth were engaged. We had just under 67 youth who participated. And uh, some came with their families and parents who stayed engaged. Some were dropped off, um, but they were as young as fifth and sixth grade all the way up through high school. And um, in the breakout session, so again, we had four breakout rooms. Um, one was on community safety and, and uh sidewalks and kind of thinking, thinking, thinking about community safety. There was a group on sustainability, uh, areas of recognition and the highway cover usage. And so some of the highlights that came from this group, for instance, were the sustainability group talked a lot about um, having places with purified air where people could go and escape from the smog or the forest fires and different things that we deal with with our Northwest air um, at a freeway. They talked about um, a desire to see an agricultural and science center be there um, as part of the workforce development and youth focus aspects. Um, they talked about watching emissions during the building process and how important it is for us to collect and regulate that data and that information and share it transparently with the community. The group that focused on um, areas of recognition talked about an Oculus with an albina tour. And for those of you who like myself had to Google what the heck an Oculus is, it is, um, it is a, a 3D. It's like the interactive um, virtual reality experience. So being able to take a tour of albina. And I just thought like, how ingenious is that? Like leave it to the kids to come up with these cool tech ideas. Um, they discuss solar plant panel trees that blend in with the green space and collect solar energy that feeds this area to help keep our, um, our energy um, uh, offset low. And they talked about uh, a jazz hub or hall of fame in addition to soul food restaurants. So that, that group did a lot of great visioning and planning. Um, the highway cover usage group talked about a career development center where they could explore career pathways, where it's an opportunity for creating access for young folks who don't know about jobs to learn about them. 
And they talked about a historic based amusement park that highlights Albina and what it felt like and, and what it would have been like at the time. A pretty cool idea. Um, and a mental health center. One thing I enjoyed about this group was they also talked about what they did not want to see. They do not want to see more law enforcement. They don't want to see more smoke shops and fast food and office buildings and condos. I think it was very clear that Portland has enough of these things and they don't want to see violence. The Safe Streets group talked about um, trying not to destroy any more homes, keeping places open, keeping schools like Tubman safe. They talked about making sure that transportation is accessible, that we mimic the bus lines that run well and not replicate the ones that are not functioning and that transportation needs to be comprehensively expanded outside of the city center. Um, Finally, um, the last thing that we talked about was, uh, let's see here, I'm just looking over my notes. Other ways to get involved that they would like to see ODOT create a Black Youth Commission um, for leadership for this project uh, moving forward. And they did mention in some of the feedback that our meetings together are not always in <laughs> as lively as it could be, um, and that they are sometimes unaccessible. So just thinking about ways that we create accessible points to reach our students, reach our community, um, and making sure that they have ways to inform our decision making. Um, so finally, I just wanna share that um, I've started to reach out to all the folks who are involved with this event to, to debrief and to talk about next steps. The youth overwhelmingly would like to see this happen again, would like to see more opportunities for them to stay engaged with the project. So I take that as marching orders into figuring out what that looks like for the next five years. Um, so thank you for giving me a, a time to share and, and I would love to hear other folks' impression of the event as well. Sprinna, thank you for that recap. That is awesome. I wonder, uh, Andrew, if you had anything you wanted to share and Mr. Edwards, I see your hand. I think um, Sprint Pasta said everything pretty eloquently and right on it. Um, it was nice to witness and hear a lot of the uh, alignment within the generation. So, um, and looking forward to continuing to see more, oppor more opportunities uh, to get their involvement in as, as well. So, but yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Mr. Washington, I see your hand. I mean, I'm sorry, Mr. Edwards, I apologize. That's okay, thank you. Um, my, my heart is smiling. Um, I am so happy. Um, this is what we've been talking about for so long to get our youth involved because they have wonderful new ideas and they think differently than we do. And that's what's going to make a, a huge difference. Thank you, Spinovasa. That was, you know, that report was so heartwarming. Um, you know, it brought tears to my eyes. So I really appreciate that. And thank you for, you know, for facilitating that and and helping our youth feel open and honest and comfortable about sharing and bringing their new ideas and letting them know that they will be heard. So thank you so much for that. Thoughts from others in the space? Maybe um, I know uh, Ms. Sharon isn't with us today. Maybe Dr. Holt. Great event. Um, well, um, uh, I think coordinated. I want to express appreciation to Sprena Vasa's vision, leadership, influence. It was evident. Uh, there were a host of folks behind the scenes that did quite a bit of work, Mira and all the work that you did to bring it together. Um, I sent out an email kind of identifying some folks. Paulina, thank you so much for all the work. And without complaint, being a troubleshooter and problem solver. And then Erica, just an example of excellence, being a superstar that day, project manager of the day, no doubt about it, to handle whatever needed to be done. It was great to see the kids interacting with the adults. It's great for the adults to interact with the kids. and 
I think it was a great beginning, a good start, a good way to tell the story, a good way to uh, influence the narrative and communicate what's going on to involve the teens and, do, and then to involve who the teens influence. So those who are under them and those who are in front of them, their parents especially. So it's a great way to help people get acclimated to this work in a different manner. We were able to diffuse some incorrect information and to infuse correct information and then get some great feedback. So great beginning, good day. Um, look forward to the next ones. Thank you so much. I uh, wanted to open if there were other HAB members who had questions or uh, thoughts about youth engagement uh, and what that might look like going forward. I don't see any, but I will say uh, again, uh, Sprint of Asa, thank you for uh, being courageous and willing to uh, partner in this space, um, provide uh, information um, for our youth and their families. Um, uh, you know, in, in a climate of um, a political drama and uncertainty and going back and forth, I think it's courageous for us to uh, stay connected uh, to tell the truth uh, and to um, encourage our youth uh, to be a part of the process. Uh, and um, we are committed to that. So I think there are advocates uh, on this process, on this HAB board, uh, not only to elevate the voice of uh, the seasoned folks in the community, but to have a uh, intergenerational uh, influence. Uh, Dr. Holt, did you have another thought? I just want to say the design team, urban design team, great work. Uh, James Mahoney and Steve Drahota, thank you very much for all that you did and how involved they were in the space. It made a difference and it makes a difference. So, Indeed. Let's go Leslie, team. did you have your hand up? Maybe not. Okay. I wanted to make sure I didn't miss you, but yeah, yes. I think that's applause. Okay, yes. But uh, yes, James uh, and the team was phenomenal. Um, just the heart for making sure that the youth are heard. Bill, uh, Steve, I'm, I'm so appreciative. Uh, with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to James uh, and we'll dive deeper uh, into some design elements. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, uh, we have two things uh, to talk about tonight. The first is, um, Along with the youth engagement, you've asked us, um, start reaching out to others. And so uh, we launched the design elements survey, right? we had been talking for a couple of months about columns and crash barriers, and we put that out on the street. And I want to share with you some information that's hot off the press. Um, may I share my screen, Natalie? So this is... Um, this is draft, but I wanted it. Um, I wanted this in your mind's eye as we talk about our work tonight. Can you all see my screen? Okay, so uh, this is draft, but we um, we took a number of design elements that we've been talking about with you, and we put it out there. Like I said, in a in a uh, online uh, survey, and these are some initial results. There's going to be more analysis on this. We're going to get this to you sometime in a couple of weeks, so that you can pour over it. And when we come back in June, we're going to have a discussion about where do we go from here, and and hopefully move the HAB towards some recommendation, recommendations and some, some decisions about some of these aesthetic treatments. So we had 318 total responses and I won't go through all of this information, but I'll just give you a gander at it and you'll have this to pour over yourselves. Um, most people came to it through the, the website uh, and some e-alerts. We had really hoped that uh, we included a QR code as part of some of the materials that the youth got on Saturday but the survey closed on Sunday. And so we were hoping that we'd get a bunch more youth to engage on that survey, but it, it looks like we didn't, uh, we didn't catch as many as we had hoped. Uh, people really responded early in uh, the period and a little bit uh, less so as the, as the survey stayed open for the duration. And this is all good information for us as we think about how we're gonna do it next time, how we're gonna get better uh, and how we're going to engage more folks. We have a couple of uh, 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 zip codes that really came out to do the, the survey. So uh, 211, 212, 2117. I'm going to move this over here um, just for you all a quick reference. Uh, 211, 212, 2117 are part of uh, what might have traditionally been um, 
designated as Albina, uh, definitely upper Albina, but these are the, the three top scoring um, uh, zip codes. And then there's another zip code that uh, 202, which is the Selwood Moreland area, uh, which also had quite a number of respondents. And then really there's, there's just a distribution across a number of zip codes. Um, so again, you'll, you'll be able to pour over this in, in great detail. Um, here's some demographic information at the outset of the survey. There were questions, and I think they were mandatory questions. You had to fill them out in order to gain entry into the survey. Um, so, so these numbers stand for themselves in terms of uh, race and ethnicity. Um, and then in terms of age distribution, we had really hoped to drive this up to 24 years or under 24 years old. We'd hope that number would go up after the use um, thing on Saturday, but it, uh, we, didn't, we didn't quite catch as many as we'd hoped there. So um, in terms of where folks are from, um, most of the respondents are folks who travel through the project area. Uh, the second highest was people who live there, um, previously live there, regularly visit, own a, a business or employed within the neighborhood, use local businesses and restaurants, um, and previously lived there, as well as this other category where people wrote uh, a bunch of things um, that, that indicate they, they may have answered in other categories. Um, but let's get into the aesthetics. So we asked them about the medallions. We've been having conversations with you all about the medallions, and we took a subset with your approval, and we put that out for uh, a visual preference. What do people like? And uh, we see here that of the medallions that reference the, uh, the historic hilltop uh, site, uh, Onion Dome, um, the, the most um, attractive to them was the yellow on yellow, um, which is this, remember this design comes from PDX Black Excellence. We got their permission to uh, use it in, in uh, the project more broadly. And there was a, you know, a 36% uh, of folks really, really like this one of uh, the four presented in this deck. When it came to uh, jazz and the sort of jump town as an inspiration for a medallion, uh, folks appreciated the one with the, with the more color, um, historic albina. Um, when it comes to some of the mud cloth uh, patterns, it was a little bit more uh, balanced. Um, and same with the Sankofa bird, a little bit more balanced. But when asked the question of which was your favorite altogether, um, there is a clear preference here, I think, for the, the, um, the two medallions that are oval in shape that reference that PDX Black Excellence design, um, and then uh, a, a cascade on down from here. Um, Interestingly enough, we also asked them, should all of the medallions on the project be the same? And there seems to be a resounding uh, sense that no, they don't all have to be the same. And so that gives us and you an opportunity to embrace a diversity of these things. I would say we're not going to introduce potentially new designs, but we have all of these designs that we can harvest and utilize around the project area. We also uh, did allow for some open-ended feedback on these issues. And so there, there is open feedback, uh, open-ended feedback a subset of which is presented here. Again, you'll have this to, to think about and digest and, and we'll come back in June and you'll come back in June and, and we can talk about it more. When it came to the crash barrier, um, we put four patterns uh, before them with your approval. Uh, we had talked about these before and there seems to be um, uh, uh, an excitement around a, a simple but elegant uh, pattern that's a combination and it's sort of inspired by some of the shapes and the things that we've, uh, we've been talking about with you. Um, there were some other ideas about that as well. And I think what I take from these other things, and I know we're not gonna go into all of the, the, the words, is there's ideas in here from the community about things that we've been talking about in other areas, right? References to historic figures. Well, we, we're, we're doing that. We just didn't have a chance to expose all of that to the community. So I think you'll find things in here that remind us of uh, conversations, discussions, and places that we're, we're already trying to create. Um, in terms of the column capitals, uh, there was a preference for one of these uh, tile patterns over the other, um, which uh, this, this set of colors actually comes from the PDX uh, Black Excellence team. It's a, uh, we harvested those colors and, and used them in this particular pattern. Um, there seems to be a preference for one of the, the concrete patterns. Um, and I had thought I had understood this, um, the, the tile patterns win out overall, that people were much more interested. I think, uh, like many have members, they're interested in color uh, in, in what is otherwise a drab environment. Um, and so there's, there's a, 
a clear preference for, for color over concrete and a couple of uh, patterns in particular. Um, I had thought this was different um, when I saw a previous draft. Um, should all the columns be the same? I thought there was a preference for yes, but it, um, it appears, and, and we'll make sure that this is accurate and all the, the, the background data is available too, but um, it seems like the, the community is, is saying they don't all have to be the same. We could have a different tile pattern on each column. I think that's, that's for us. You, we've got more feedback now. The question is, what are we going to do with it? Um, we, we took this action and we, we plan to go forward and ask more questions about more aesthetic uh, and project um, decisions because that's what you've been asking us for. Uh, and so this is just a gander. Um, it's the beginnings of some feedback that you've requested. Um, and we, this isn't the only tool that we have at our disposal to get broader engagement, right? So we had the youth engagement forum that was in person. There's the potential to use focus groups. There's other ways. And we're gonna start to diversify the ways that we take some of the topics. Like we'll talk about a topic tonight around chapters in the narrative and sort of how do we tell a complex story um, that's a little bit too complicated to just put into a visual survey. So it's gonna require some different kinds of community conversation, but um, we will have this, uh, this data to you uh, sometime in uh, May or June and route to a, 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 a more full discussion of these topics. And where do we go from here uh, in the June meeting? But I'll pause there for comments, questions uh, about what you've seen. Estelle, I see your hand. Um, um, what were the main zip codes that were the responses again? Uh, the 9711, or 211 uh, had 44, 97212 had 33, 217 had 26, 202 had 12, and then it goes on down there into the 11s, 10s, 9s. So those three were the, the, the predominant responses. I don't have the percentage, but the, the team, we, like, like we said, this just closed on Sunday. So this is just a, a preview of the kind of analysis and data and crosswalk that we'll be able to do. So not really any from like outer East Portland? No, plenty, plenty Estelle here. I'll, I'll put the, I'll share my screen again. Um, plenty of other zip codes represented, just not to the same magnitude uh, as the other. Can you see that now? Yeah. Okay. So um, let me see if I can zoom in here. So, I mean, there's, there's 20 to, I don't, maybe that's, maybe that's even 30 zip codes from the region where there's some representation. There's just a concentration um, in North and Northeast Portland. 97202 is like, I grew up in East Moreland. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And that, that's coming in at number four in terms of responses. I, is that representative of, of who we're trying to target as far as feedback goes? Well, so, so what I would say is the, the survey was public. And so um, we tried to amplify and reach to particular communities, but it was public. It was, it was on the public website. The reason the team elected to catch demographic data is to try to parse kind of who said what, I believe. Now, now the, maybe there's someone on the owner's rep team who wants to, or the engagement team who wants to get into that, but the goal is to take this information and give you a little bit more um, insight into who said what, I believe. And Estelle, I'll chime in here as well. Um, this is where, you know, our, our um, community can be strong and support each other. Um, and having uh, your networks help us here. Um, and I think, I'm not sure, I don't want to speak out of turn, but in, in regards to other surveys, I think almost 100 um, folks who identify as uh, Black and African responding to the survey um, is more than we've had before. Uh, and so maybe a testament uh, to some of us pushing into our networks. And so um, we wanted to make sure they were posted in areas, uh, there's a large group uh, on Facebook called Black Portland, um, some of the other um, avenues that um, folks from Historic Albina uh, would be and have access to. Uh, so it really was the goal for us to, uh, and I think it is part of the project values to elevate the voice 
um, of the Black community. Uh, we just wanted to make sure uh, that um, it was open to everyone, uh, but there's still a desire to make sure that we focus in on those who have historic ties, and that's why we ask those questions. Thank you. Other questions? We will we'll get this into your inbox soon. Um, perhaps too, it would help um, if <clears throat> to maybe have the map of zip codes and have the, the respondent numbers in those particular zip codes. That would that would help too, so we can see what area of the city that they're coming from and the ethnicity. It, 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 it'd be an overlay of actually three three pieces of data. Understood. I um, am not the person who is doing the, the analysis behind the scenes, but we, what you've asked for, Keith, will be represented to them, and we will see to what degree we can get, what fine grain uh, we can get in terms of who said what and, and from which zip code. Thank you. Other thoughts or questions in regards to the initial survey data? Okay, seeing none, James, I'll turn it back to you. All right, so um, Tiffany's gonna um, pull up the Miro board and start sharing her screen. But as she does that, uh, I'll just do a little table setting to say what we're gonna, what we're gonna discuss tonight really came out of last, the last HAB meeting. Last HAB meeting, we talked about walls, and then we talked about bridge, lettering, gateways, signage, treatments. And in that discussion, um, I think it was Ms. Sharon in particular who said, we're getting into words and telling the story. And yet it's hard to see what, wh which chapter gets told where. What is the overarching narrative? Where would we say one thing versus another? And so the, the urban design team heard that and has gone back. And we want to revisit this topic about the narrative, the what what are we saying? What is what is the stories? What are the words? What are the things that are, are getting told across the entire project? Um, and, and we're going to dwell there for a while with you. If there's time remaining, we'll revisit quickly um, walls and we'll revisit quickly um, bridge treatments because we're trying to get those two elements ready to go out to another survey that will be open and available for the public to comment on throughout the summer. And we'll come back in the fall and talk about those elements. Again, in the spirit of trying to get you more information about what the community is thinking so that you're not the only ones reviewing and making decisions about um, these things. So we'll, we're gonna fo focus primarily on the chapters of the story and the narrative and, and sort of some ideas that we've been developing. Um, and if time remains, we'll talk about those other two topics. So with that, I will hand it to Bill um, and Tiffany, and I'm, uh, I can help you guys along as you, as you wish. Sounds good. And I will try to minimize excessive zooming on the Miro, but it's always a challenge. So you, everyone just speak up if it's not big enough or I've moved too much. So um, this diagram, chapters of the narrative, like James said, is our attempt to organize a lot of the smaller design ideas that we've talked about with you all um, and make it clear where we can really tell the albina story that needs to be told. Um, and these are focused in areas that we've talked about that are places that are most prominent on the project where there are a lot of eyes, a lot of people moving slowly where we have an opportunity to really make an impression um, or places that were really significant and are significant to the black community in Portland. So we're, we're gonna start in the South um, over here, this is wall 15 that we talked about in the last meeting, the most prominent wall in the project, when you come over the steel bridge right before you get to the motor center. And we see this chapter as introducing and acknowledging historic Albina. Um, and this came out of um, the enthusiasm we heard at the last HAB meeting for naming Albina on this wall, for showing historic Albina in terms of historic photos, maybe art. So really, this is an introduction to really start the story. Um, but because people are moving quickly through this area, we're not thinking this is the place to full, tell that full nuanced story that needs to be told. So continuing to move north, um, 
this is the Rose Quarter Transit Center where we have a new bridge over Multnomah and Holiday. So there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, and we see this as a place to really elevate and celebrate and educate people about the black leaders of Oregon. Um, there is an idea that's been floating around a little bit before that I think we've talked about some called the Pillars of Albina. And those are literally covering the 12 new pillars or columns for this bridges as a way to really um, celebrate these black leaders of Oregon. And Bill is gonna get into some initial ideas on themes and people um, a little bit after this, but that's what happens there. This next chapter, it's kind of a one idea that we haven't talked about quite as much. Um, this is a current um, kind of grassy area right next to um, the freeway and on-ramps and off-ramps, um, but it will be pretty prominent from the air, from the covers. And we think that's an opportunity to tell a visual story about cultural heritage. We've heard before some interest in um, honoring the First Nations of Portland and indigenous tribes this area. We've also talked a lot about um, infusing this project with heritage patterns, uh, the mud cloth patterns, other um, really um, rich cultural patterns. So we see that this area is, could be an opportunity to kind of do a visual honoring of one or both. Um, next is really the bulk of uh, what we heard in our last HAB meeting where we think um, there's a lot of really interesting work to be done. This is uh, Williams Avenue leading up from the Moda Center area onto the covers. And we see this as the place to tell the chronological history, starting from the First Nations through how Albina was built and settled and um, all of the things, good and bad that happened there, and then leading into the future of what this area is becoming through all this process. And Bill is going to talk um, in more detail about what these potential chapters in this chronological history are. But we see this as an opportunity to do that literal walking tour that Ms. Sharon brought up and others on the have to really um, tell that richer, deeper story of Albina that cannot be done in just a wall or a piece of art. It needs to be done over time and absorbed um, in a slower way. And then moving to the North, um, the chapters here are kind of ideas we have talked about a little bit more. Um, so moving up to Harriet Tubman in previous HAB meetings, we've heard interest in using that school community face of the wall um, to really focus and honor women of color education. We've heard some interest in making it local, some interest in expanding this to nationwide. So that, that can be figured out. We heard some enthusiasm for that and that makes a lot of sense given the context. And then finally, uh, we land up at Russell Street, the new bridge on the east side. And we've heard some enthusiasm for um, leaning into the history of Russell Street um, as a location of really important black entrepreneurs entrepreneurship locations and civic institutions and honoring that and telling that part of the story there. So we're talking about six chapters, not necessarily experienced in that order, but um, we see that as a, a good way to kind of tell the story in bite-sized pieces and more, um, more involved pieces, but really the hardest working chapters in the story are the Williams Walk, where we tell the chronological history, and the Pillars of Albina, where we're honoring individuals. So before Bill gets in, let's pause. Yeah, and I'll only interject in a moment of pause to say that it is the expectation that other collaborators will come into the project. We might call them artists, historians, whatever. This isn't something that we do um, it's going to be something that a broader group of community folks will. So when we talk about those pillars of Albina and there's 12 of them, that's 12 opportunities to identify people to collaborate with, to develop what we could call art or an historical kiosk. Same with the Williams Walk. There can be multiple milestones in the way we develop the actual street and the pavement and the lighting that provides opportunities for many more collaborators to get involved. So think of uh, the work that we're doing together now as, as the urban design team is setting up a framework for collaboration and enrichment with others. Mr. Edwards, I see your hand. 
Thank you very much. Um, I guess I'd like to ask a question and then I, I'll share a comment. Um, kind of a rhetorical question, but well, no, it's not a rhetorical question. The um, Civil and Human Rights Museum in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I don't know how many of you have had an opportunity to visit it, but I'm wondering if we could um, virtually visit it, um, if that could be arranged. Um, because that really um, impressed me years ago when I was had an opportunity to be there. Um, one reason is because um, in the civil rights portion of the museum, they have a um, a, um, a lunch counter where the uh, folks that used to sit in at lunch counters and you put the earphones on and you sit at the lunch counter and you close your eyes and you actually experience what it was like to be at that lunch counter back in the 1960s. You hear the, um, the, um, the language that was used um, uh, toward um, African-Americans that were sitting there, your seat rumbles back and forth and you're there. Even though that's 60 years ago, you're there. That um, kind of opportunity doesn't exist here, but that concept can certainly exist here. Upstairs at the human rights um, portion of the museum, they, you see people around the world that have, um, that have promoted um, human rights in their particular area, whether it's Thailand, Cambodia, um, India, uh, Pakistan, and you hear them speak and you see them speak. Um, that's the reason I would hope that these um, different areas would be static and not stationary, that we would be able to um, uh, have them be changed. Now, the introduction acknowledgement, it makes sense to me that um, that would be um, uh, more stationary in, in content, so because that's not going to change. But at the same time, these other um, areas, um, in order to acknowledge the history, I think it's important that they do change over time and maybe replicate it in, in, a, in a periodic way. You know, maybe I, I go in January and I see um, black leaders that are being represented and maybe if I go back in, in July, there are different black leaders that are being represented. And then two years later or 18 months later, I go back and I see the same ones that were represented in, in January in the 18 months previous. Um, I hope I'm trying to get across what I'm trying to express is that we want to make sure that everyone is acknowledged here because it took all of those that we stand on their shoulders that made historic albina. And we don't want to leave anyone out. Um, granted, um, no, I can't stand there for 18 months and see everybody perhaps, and maybe it takes 24 months for me to see everyone that contributed to historic albina. But everyone needs to be recognized a different part. And, it, and I think it's unique to be able to come back and say, oh, I didn't know about so-and-so that did this. When I was here before, I saw someone else that did that. And I think that's important to capture all of our history because we, want, we don't wanna leave any of our history out because it's all important. The good, the bad, the ugly, all of it is important because it, it all contributed in building Albina. And you know, if we don't share that information, how those youth that were there last Saturday or last Friday, how, how in the, last Saturday, I guess it was, how in the world are they gonna um, have this information that they need to have for history's sake and know where they came from? Because they may get it from a grandparent, but they may not get the, all of the story and all the story needs to be told in this particular area. And that's what this is about in my opinion is that we tell the whole story of historic albino 
Um, and it can't be told in a month. It can't be told in a year, but it can be told over time. And I think that's what's important. Thanks for your feedback. Other thoughts um, about the chapters in the narrative and um, particular areas of acknowledgement or recognition? Was there something or an area that you think we may have missed? Um, do you think this captures um, a good start? Again, there's gonna be collaborators and partners. This is the project setting the table to begin that conversation um, and um, making sure that we're representing all of those things, Mr. Edwards, that you're talking about, but wanna make sure that we're on the right track and um, that the table we set is, is right. You know, if it's a formal dinner, we don't wanna set for a barbecue. So let's make sure that we have. <laughs> Well, no. <laughs> uh, Bill, do you want to talk a little yeah. bit more about, so So we've thought, yeah. remember, it's an infrastructure project and there's certain things, just like setting the table, there's certain things that infrastructure projects can do well and other things that they might not. I hear what you're saying uh, about telling the story over time. And I think of video and I think of interactive, what the kids were saying, right? Like there could be something really dynamic about this installation, right? But that's probably one piece. Um, there's some things that might be a little bit more static. And the truth is we can do a little bit of, uh, of all of it. Bill has put more thought yeah. into if, if we did that, if we said Williams Avenue is historically important, it is also a place because it's on the cover where we have some breathing room to do something different and more robust. We could make a public realm that anyone could stroll through at a leisurely pace and a comfortable and safe environment and read some of the milestones or the big chapters in the history of black Americans in Oregon and in Portland. So Bill has sort of started to go right. into like, well, what, what, you know, ultimately it's gonna have to turn into how many chapters can we tell, how many can fit on the, the property that we'll have. And, and uh, so Bill started to take a, a whack at that. Thanks, James. Um, what I, and as, as James was starting to, talk about it. What I've done is trying to take a look at the, the history of African Americans or in Oregon and try to break that experience down from the early days of the explorers and fur trade people first coming in to the early homesteaders all the way up until current times. And I've went in and, and you might want to zoom in on this a little bit more, Tiffany, but I've went in and broken this down and I explained a little of this at the at the HAB forum where I broke this down into like seven different chapters. And what I've described here is just briefly, I'll go through each of these chapters with a few of the highlights of what's, what is supposedly happening during these phases and how I broke it out in this way. But the idea is that these seven become our storyline for the experience in Oregon. And somehow it represents the content. And then going back to the way James talked about it, it could be done in many different ways, but this is the content of what we're trying to um, represent and explore in present to the, to the community of anyone who's interested in watching this. So the first one I had was really kind of exploring the Pacific Northwest. It's kind of like the pre-1840s um, when African-Americans were first here during the employment and the fur trade for the Pacific Northwest, also involved about the time of the Oregon Trail era, and when all of a sudden homesteading was happening in Oregon when a few African-Americans were, were coming to Oregon to homestead it. The second chapter is kind of like 1868 to 1905 was when Portland kind of emerges as a city. It's more the emergence of the railroads and hospitality, the big hotels like the, the Portland Hotel. Um, and African-American businesses slowly started to take shape uh, as, as things progressed in the city. And eventually this is when the Golden West Hotel opened, uh, first African-American um, hotel that allowed African-Americans ownership, but also uh, clientele. The third section happens to be Portland and the World's Fair, um, 1900 up to 1930. Um, the World's Fair is in 1905, and of course, P Portland is getting ready for that. Um, it, as, it, as, it, as it does that, it begins to displace African-American residences and businesses. Um, and again, at this time, the KKK 
begins to appear in Oregon and the NAACP opens, opens an office. Um, that ends up being that kind of that third phase up until the 1930s. You then have kind of what I call the emergence of community institutions, kind of around the 1920s through the 1940s. Segregation and discrimination are commonplace. Uh, redlining has still forced the African-American community to kind of resettle in the Albina, the Freedom area and the Sugar Hill areas. Community institutions begin to emerge, such as newspapers, social clubs, civic organizations, and churches. And then African-American businesses continue to expand into the building and into the trades industry. We come up to the next one as kind of World War II and contemporary Portland, 1940 through 1950s. The uh, Portland shipyards were our strong employer. We've had a strong African-American migration from the South uh, coming up to work in the shipyards. And the Urban League has been formed to kind of support the rights of the, of the workers and the labor movement. The African-American businesses continue to, to, to survive and expand. And again, churches and civic organizations get very active in the civil rights movement. The Vanport, Vanport flood occurs and the entire community is displaced and forced to resettle in Albino. During the 1950s and the 60s, I kind of label that as the, the black professional achievements. Um, the black and the employment opportunities tend to emerge for African-Americans in fields such as education, law, government, politics, medicine, building trades, unions in the labor movement, transportation, athletics, and public utilities. There's also then the continued displacement of the African-American community with the introduction of Memorial Coliseum, and the I-5 East Bank, East Bank Freeway. And then finally, the last one, displacement and gentrification begins with 1960 and continues on today. Uh, displacement started when, uh, continued with the, the federal model cities program, which went in to revitalize urban areas. And at that time, organizations such as the Black United Front, the Black United Fund of Oregon, the Black Panther parties continued to address economic and social issues of the African-American community. So briefly, what I've tried to do is just, and I, it's, it's pretty brief and I'm no historian, but from the information I was able to gather, these are kind of the chapters that I was kind of seeing that we might wanna talk about the African-American experience in the state of Oregon, but then specifically in Portland. And as James mentioned, this is we kind of, kind of form the nucleus of the content of how this walk, memorial walk or, or this, um, opportunity to create a storyline, this would be kind of the information we would kind of use as a basis to kind of begin to tell that story and hopefully get your involvement and get the community's involvement to a little bit more about how we round this out and how we shape this. Thank you, Bill. Sure. So that's a lot of content and, and we are, I want to be mindful of time, but, but we've, we've put a lot out there. Um, maybe some time for some questions and I do see Sabrina's got her hand up. Yes, uh, Bill, that was awesome. Thank you so much for the time um, and intention you put into pulling that together. It was really cool just to, to walk through that and see, a, um, to have you paint the picture and in, in the history like that. So two things that I was thinking of as I was listening to you share that and also thinking about Mr. Edwards's comment earlier um, about accessing the history. Um, I would love for us to see the connection to, um, the, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the name now. It's out in the Wallawas, um, our heritage, Maxville, Maxville. Heritage yes. Interpretive Center, um, because a lot of folks don't know that connection to the logging industry and black people being here before the state was legalized outside of Portland. So I think that's a, a key uh, piece to put in. And then I was just thinking about how crucial it will be. And I, I don't know whose role this is in the context of this project, but how crucial it will be for there to be conversations around public-private partnership, like with the Oregon Historical Society and Portland State and different schools so that these walking tours come with a curriculum and come with ideas for conversation um, already established and come with commitments from people whose job it is to 
always have and hold this history to make sure they're thinking about this as we're building it, um, where we can scan the QR code and be able to go to a website for deeper conversation if your family wants to explore more. Um, so that's just where my mind went is to that, the relationship building and um, kind of curious what you all think we can be doing to foster those conversations um, with people who can make sure that these p key connections um, kind of stay and live beyond the, the walkable parts of the area. Great, great comment. I think that, I think um, that's a great comment. I think we can, you know, to me, those are, those kind of options are, are doable. And it's one of the things that the, uh, the youth talked about with the QR codes and using um, uh, virtual reality and other media to kind of share and exchange in a remote location. Um, so I think that's all kind of, you know, to me, very doable. Um, I'm gonna just quickly just switch over to the, the pillars of, of um, Albina because what I've done in, in <laughs> I, I quickly put together this quick table that kind of defines the 12 pillars that we do have. And I went in and kind of began to look at elements of our community and began to start to develop a quick chess checklist of some of the individuals and organizations that could be part of each of these pillars. So imagine that each one of these is a, is a pillar. Um, and you know I've listed things such as industry, civic organizations, churches, education, government, building trades, professionals, entertainment and music, athletics, judicial system, business, public utilities and infrastructure. And, and one of the things that I, I think we learned from, I think the last HAB forum and with the youth the other day is, what these columns could, could recognize many, many people and organizations. And with something as similar as a, a barcode, we could, we could have a lot of information gathered and collected that you could use and read at another time. But you could also have something that was right in front of you that you could see immediately while you were looking at this display. So as you can read this, as you can, I won't spend the time going through the, the individual items on the um, ADH pillar, but you can begin to see the process that I'm starting to go through and at least starting to look at who could we recognize? There are so many people, there are so many organizations um, and begin to start to set up just how do we do something like that and take the information, Keith, that you talked about, about how do we make this more transparent and more available to folks. We can do this electronically in technology. We can bring this in and make this work. And um, this, I think I just wanted to present to you about the ideas that I think the urban design team has been looking at and talked about um, with Tiffany and Marianne and James, just a, a way to kind of capture the theme and to be another way to kind of help provide another element in terms of this as we weave together the story of Albina There'll be some elements on the crash barriers. There'll be some elements on the on in exhibits on the pillars. Um, and we, we've got opportunities here to do things in a lot of different ways. And this would be maybe one way we kind of capture some of the themes and some of the leaders, but also some of the organizations. But begin to acknowledge a lot more folks by using some technology to making that happen. Thoughts? Mr. Washington has his hand raised. It was a lot in one hour. You know, it sounds like it's almost like as if what I missed, you know, and I'm sitting here trying to think about all the things that would be that were being said. Now, I'm just curious, did a lot of these ideas, where did a lot of these, just a few questions, I was just curious, where did a lot of these ideas come from? Did it come from you guys as staff or did it come from the HAB, more or less, some of the ideas or the community engagement stuff? Um, uh, for example, I would say quite a bit of this. We talked quite a bit about this in the urban design team. Um, we've had, I mean, we've traveled, we've seen other exhibits, we've seen other parks, we've seen other way communities have um, worked, some successful and some not successful. And I think what, what I think has been most enjoyable for me working as part of the team has been getting, getting my colleagues um, understanding about what's out there and what's possible. And then being able to yeah. and have conversations with HAB and with the youth or in just in general and begin to tell you that there's a lot of things that are possible and it's just up to our imagination and opportunities to try to see, can we put something together that really works and aligns with everybody's missions and everybody's goals and 
how do we make that work? So I think it's been a, a combination of a lot of different players in this. Um, I think it was our role to kind of take out the lead and kind of give you something to respond to. Um, and I think that's kind of how we approached it. Yeah, thanks, Bill, on that. Yeah. And the other part, I was just curious about another question. Um, so when you established your timelines, um, just a small suggestion, I was just curious, did you, did you read the Albina plan? Have you ever viewed the Albina plan? Yes, I have. Yeah, it's and been, been so a while, you were but, familiar I mean, with the you were familiar with the Comstock incident, right? No, I'm not. So I was just curious as you know, the reason why I'm making mention of the Comstock incident because it sets precedence in the timeline in the territory. Okay. So you might want to go back and read the Comstock incident. Okay. And the other one was in terms of looking at AR, it's something that, uh, you know, my company had been doing for the last year and a half, two years, I think now. And it's called AR, augmented reality. And, um, and it would be really interesting as to all of what I've heard you guys talk about, all the intersections, you using QR code, but that's kind of antiquated to some degree. The AR stuff that we're doing right now is a really much more powerful thing to where, you know, the I-5, uh, you know, the logo and all that, you know, it would be really interesting to make an app for the i5. And so whenever you run up on these things, that that app can be what we call the augmented reality aspect of it. So anytime somebody downloads the app of the i5, is that they're able to access at any given point, putting their phone or their computer over anything that is associated with this, with this process or with this design that they can, that that, once they put their phone or that app on it, that they can get all the intersection points that we want to create, all the creative backdrop, rather if it's video, rather if it's uh, internet, rather if it's text, whatever it is, that AR could could exist in the back end of that, on that app. So it's a real interesting technology. It hasn't been, a, it's kind of relatively new. We've been working with it for the last two years. And so I think it's a real interesting thing that you guys take a look at, because I think it can bring all of what you're talking about together in one backdrop. So just a suggestion, you guys might want to take a look at you. If you guys are interested in taking a look at it, I can show you a little bit of it. Um, and so, but the other part, keep up the good work. But I think it's, as it's been said, it's a, it's a big story to tell. And the last part of that was too, man, just recently I found out something about success, the history of black successful uh, communities that have been placed underwater, <laughs> you know, or have water associated with their demise, or they are, or these successful cities and towns. I've I heard that there were more than a hundred of these successful communities across the across the country that are now buried underwater, and 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 ironically, so the Albina story was, is one of those stories. And I never realized how much water it was associated with, with the demise of a lot of these black communities that were successful. So, and there's some, in, some interesting literature and some stuff out right now being published about those cities. So there may be some connection because as you know, the river is there where we're looking at the albina, the flood, all of that kind of stuff. So it would be interesting to connect those things. So that's my contribution this evening. I was just, but I'm fascinated with how much information we got to try to put in a small space. Well, thanks, John. I, I, I appreciate your, uh, your support for this. And I think the idea of technology, I think represents a really good, um, a good opportunity to see if we can't use that and work here and leverage that. Right, right. Also, and if you need some information on the bill, just give me a holler. I'll, I'll get you the information. Over to you. Okay, will do. Thank you. All right. All right. Yeah. To, thank you, Mr. Washington. I appreciate all of those uh, comments. I'd love to move to Mr. Edwards uh, and then um, for the sake of our time, move to, to, to adjourn our meeting. Mr. Edwards. Thank you very much, um, Erica. Um, Bill, thank you very much for sharing that information. Uh, I, I'll be very brief. I just wanted to make sure that there was a correction. Uh, Mercedes Diaz was a judge, and I just wanted to make that um, um, that, yes. correct, that correction on there under the judicial system. Got it. Yeah. She was also, I believe, the first African-American attorney in the state of Oregon. I'm not sure about that, but yeah. I know that she certainly was the, the first African American judge. Yes, um, in um, in Oregon. Yeah, uh, we'll take care of that. Okay, thank you. Yep. 
So, if, Eric, if this is going to conclude, I'll just give you, uh, you all, we really hope that you can sustain your attention into our June meeting, because in June, we're going to talk about those, uh, the survey and what, what your review of that survey data leads you to, to direct us to do for the project in terms of columns and crash barriers. But we're also going to ask for your permission to send out another survey um, that builds on the conversation tonight, but focuses on some walls. We've talked about walls before, uh, and we've talked about it in the, the collaboration forum, as well as some bridge treatments. So we don't have the time to, to do that all tonight um, because we promised a shorter meeting, but we will revisit that in June and in the collaboration forum. So come on down. Thank you so much, Tiffany, James, Bill, uh, for your attention to this and for diving into what um, will be an awesome opportunity to honor historic Albina uh, and to honor uh, the ground in which the, the, the freeway, the highway is on and this new cap uh, and how we might um, uh, look to uh, the young people for our future. Um, this is all really exciting work. I appreciate um, your commitment. Um, we know that it's going to take collaborative partnerships. And so um, Sprinavasa, you're right on there. It's gonna take a lot more. This project is doing their due diligence to kind of, again, using that analogy, set the table uh, and provide opportunity for additional conversations, additional collaborative work uh, so that we create uh, the future that we want to see. Uh, Miss Natalie, if you would share the slides um, again. Moving forward, I wanna draw your attention to an email uh, that you all received with the draft letter of the IGA support letter. I'm looking for your comments and feedback uh, within the next 10 days or so. Um, so please take a look at that. We are hoping uh, and encouraging that there be a joint letter of support from this board as well as the COAC. Uh, so please uh, avail yourself to that, any comments uh, edits, feedback, please respond to me um, and I'll try to incorporate um, all of that. Uh, we'll be moving um, summer and fall to advance uh, cover design, updating the environmental assessment, uh, and there will be some technical analyses uh, as well as updates to the diversity plan. Uh, and then um, kind of the DBE and workforce finalizing early work package designs. So that's why we're gonna be looking to you all in June to help us make some uh, determinations uh, in regards to some of those things moving forward. Uh, and so um, we appreciate you. Definitely, uh, Dr. Holt, any closing remarks for us today? Uh, two things I would say. Thanks, HAP members, for being present. We want to make sure that we're honoring your intelligence, your insight, and your investment. Uh, and so part of the concentration of focus and what could feel like uh, just a barrage of information is to optimize that. So thank you for uh, that. And any feedback, we've been talking about it, Erica's been mentioning it on, on a regular basis about feedback regarding time and time availability and what works and what doesn't work. So just keep that in the back of your mind. And then secondly, uh, this process really reflects the uh, effort of transition and or change or how things change when you're involved in the change process. It doesn't happen fast. Um, doesn't happen right away. It's really a process, step upon step, piece upon piece, bit by bit. And if you miss three of those pieces or two of those pieces, it could seem like you've missed a major step because so much of it is intense and so much of it is concentrated. So we value your investment. We value your time. We value what this is going to create, this partnership. Thanks for your uh, time this evening. I know that there's a uh, NBA game playoff game happening. So I want to be sensitive to that for those of you who are basketball uh, aficionados. We appreciate you. Thanks, Miss Erica, for your great leadership and everybody for being here tonight. Have a good one. Stay safe, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.